Hi, welcome back to another episode of Rachel Teaches Math. Today we're going to be looking at characteristics of quadrant functions which are written in vertex form. It's going to be a lot of information, but it's kind of all-inclusive, so this is your one-stop shop. We are going to start with reminding you to like and subscribe to my channel, okay, if you find this information helpful. Starting with the equation j of x equals 3 times x minus 1 squared minus 4, I just want to recap how to graph this function in vertex form. So for my previous video, hopefully you're okay with this form uh, where this is your negative h and this is your negative, or that's your k value, which basically represents your vertex. Okay, so if I'm writing this in vertex form, it's like j of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. So my vertex is actually going to be at a positive one, the opposite of what's in parentheses, and negative four. So I'll go from zero, zero, I'm gonna to go to the right one, and down four. Now, we already have one of our pieces of information for our characteristics. So the vertex is at one, negative four. From there, I'm gonna use our standard, typical growth rate to figure out where will my next points be. So usually what I have my students do is along the side, just write down what your typical growth rate is for a quadratic. I'm gonna use this little edge here. So this is my work to support. If A equals one, if my dilation is one, then my growth rate is one over one, three over one, five over one, seven over one, and that will continue um, infinitely unless there are restrictions on your domain. Well, in this case, A equals three. So instead of one over one, if A equals three, it's going to be three over one. Instead of three over one, it will be up nine over one, and up 15 over one, seven times three, 21 over one, and obviously we're not going to have enough space for that. So I'll get just a couple extra coordinates in there from my vertex. Now I know I'm going to be going up three and to the right one. You can also go up three and to the left one since a quadratic has symmetry vertically. From there, I'm going to go up nine over one. Hopefully I have enough space to go up at least one more point. So I'm going up three, six, nine over one, and then the same on the left side. Okay, now I have a nice quadratic shape here, um, shape of parabola, and I'm going to attach to connect this, though my shadow is going to be blocking me, so maybe not as nice as my quadratics normally are. Okay. Okay, look at those curves. Wow. Nice. Okay, so from there, I know it's opening up, so I definitely have a minimum point. So if it's ever opening up, you're gonna have a minimum. If it opens down, you have a maximum. So I know that I can circle minimum for this uh, characteristic. Now, typically you want two pieces of information. I need to know, is my vertex at a maximum or minimum? And then I say the location. So there are two ways that your teachers could ask you to do this. They might ask for the minimum written as a coordinate, okay? They might also, also ask you just to say what the minimum height is. So you could write this two ways. You could say the minimum is at y equals negative four, or you could say the minimum is at the coordinate of one negative four. So I would take both ways. Okay, now your line of symmetry. The line of symmetry kind of determines where do you stop decreasing and start increasing, okay? So if you're reading a graph, it's from left to right. So imagine you're like walking along this and you're going down. So it's definitely decreasing first. Changes directions at x equals one and then it starts to increase again. So it's really helpful just to draw in your line of symmetry. So my line of symmetry is exactly at x equals one and the line of symmetry should be a dotted line. And then I'll just label that. That is x equals one. 
and now we have another key piece of information. So from the left, you have to imagine that this function is going to continue to expand forever. So it's technically starting at negative infinity and going to one where it's decreasing. So it's decreasing from negative infinity to one, or you could also just say if x is less than one, it's decreasing. So decreasing when x is less than one, okay? Then every value after one, it starts to increase. So I'm going to say my increasing interval, I think the easiest way to write this, is if x is greater than one, okay? Think about for a second why I'm not including one. Okay, because I didn't say that it's decreasing when x is less than or equal to one. I didn't say that it was increasing when x is greater than or equal to one. At one, it kind of stops. That's your change point. That's, um, it's not increasing or decreasing. It's at a minimum. So we don't include that value. Okay? Now, your domain. Domain represents all of your possible x values. Well, in this case, this is going to continue to grow from negative infinity to infinity. It's going to continue to expand. So I could say a few different ways. I could say my domain is from negative infinity to infinity. And with infinity symbols, we always use parentheses because infinity is an idea. It's not a solid start or end point. It's an idea that numbers can go on forever. I could also just say, all real numbers, like write that out, all real numbers. But I like to use this symbol, which is an R with a line, like a parallel line to the back of the R. That means all real numbers, okay? Now the last part, your range. If you know where your minimum is, then you can say that it's starting at your minimum for your Y values and then increasing forever. And if there was a maximum, then your range would be from that max and then decreasing forever. So my range is from y equals negative four to infinity. Again, I can write this two different ways. I can say it's from negative four, which is an included value, to infinity, This range is your y values, or I could just say y is greater than or equal to negative four. Whew, a lot of information, okay? The last and I just recorded my coordinates here. It's always helpful to um, have a table of values so you kind of can double check that your equation matches. Could have also put this into y equals in your calculator and gotten your table of values if you're having a little bit of trouble graphing using the transformations. The next part I'm gonna go into is finding your x-intercepts and your y-intercepts, okay? So, if I want to find my y-intercept, that is when x equals zero, okay? So x equals zero at every spot along the y-axis, okay? So I'm going to say f of zero equals, and then I'm literally just going to plug in zero any place I see an x in my equation. And that would be three times zero minus one squared, just using the original equation, and then minus four. Zero minus one is negative one. Negative one squared is one. So this is the same as three times one, then minus four. Three times one is three. Three minus four equals negative one. So I can confirm that my y-intercept should be at negative one. Look back on your graph. It did cross at negative one. Okay. Now this part for the x-intercepts, I'm actually going to go into that into a, in a later video because that would be basically factoring a standard form equation and then finding where your solutions are. That's a little advanced. What I would recommend you do is um, you can type this into y equals for now, and then just trace along and get an estimate for where your x-intercepts are. But I am gonna go into that a little bit more in depth in the next few videos. All right, got a lot of information here. I'm just gonna summarize with answering a few questions. If I give you your standard or your vertex form of a 
quadratic in the form of f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. Using this formula, what point is the vertex of the parabola? Well, my vertex is represented by what's in parentheses after x and then k. Okay, so it's the coordinate h, k for my vertex. What is the equation for the line of symmetry? Well, hopefully you notice that whatever your h value is, so in this case, it was one, that's the same as your line of symmetry because it goes straight down the middle of your parabola. So it should be x equals h. Now this is a good summary, but for a lot of students, kind of looking at so many variables, you just kind of say, nope, I'm done. I'm done with this problem. I don't, it's too many variables. I can't math. So maybe just focus on the numbers and then this will become a little bit more comfortable to you if you continue to write this form above every question that you work on. How can we tell if the parabola opens up or down? Well, if this A value is a positive number, it's going to open up. If it's negative, it will open down. Okay? And then how do you identify the dilation? Again, dilation is your growth rate, so that's associated with your A value. So this one is growing three times faster. I'm just gonna summarize by saying it's your A value, and that would be the leading coefficient of the vertex form of the equation, okay? So please feel free to comment if you have any questions below. Remember to like and subscribe. Hopefully this was helpful for you and kind of summarize everything you need to know. Like and subscribe, bye.